Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Gautam Rao. He's going to talk about familiarity is not pre contempt, generosity, discrimination, and diversity in Delhi schools. Gautam is a PhD candidate from Berkeley. He's a behavioral economist, a lot of field experiments, and also is my cousin. So take it away. Yeah. Uh, this is not true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Justin's from the side of the family that has the nice hair. Uh, hair. Yes. Uh, Right, so it's a great pleasure to be here today, and I'm, I'm excited, excited to talk about my work on how mixing rich and poor kids together in schools in India changes social behaviors. Uh, I'm particularly excited to be presenting to a diverse audience, but you know, forgive me if, if there's anything at all that I say that, that isn't clear, particularly to the non-economists in the room. You know, stop me, uh, and in general, stop me for questions uh, at any time. Uh, I'm not going to plan to leave 10 minutes at the end for, for Q&A. So this research is, is motivated by two broad observations. The first is that schools appear to be segregated across income or economic lines in many countries to different degrees. And a lot of research has understandably examined what effects that has on disparities in academic achievement. But we know relatively little about how that might matter for social behaviors. Think of intergroup attitudes, discrimination, interactions. Uh, you know, these are things that might matter a lot in unequal, diverse, or polarized countries uh, like India or the United States. Second, and more broadly in some sense, uh, even economists have now come to understand that social preferences, concerns about fairness, these things are important in the economy and, you know, in, in explaining human behavior, but we know relatively little about how these preferences or, or attitudes are shaped. Uh, and in particular, uh, could they be affected by lifetime experiences and therefore even by policy? And motivated in these two quite broad ways, I'm going to answer the much narrower question, which is how does being mixed with poor kids in your schools change the social behaviors of rich students? Uh, and in particular, how does it change their pro-social behavior and generosity towards others? Uh, and their fairness preferences, perhaps in a deeper sense, but also, does it change their willingness to socialize with or to discriminate against the poor? And if there are effects on these social outcomes, do they come at some cost to the academic achievement uh, of these rich students? Yeah. I'm wondering if you are mixing mostly poor students with a few rich students. or Because I actually versa, am yeah. a product of busing on both sides. My elementary school, a few poor students were bused in. And then junior high, I was bused to a poor neighborhood and very different Absolutely. dynamics and I think very different outcomes. Absolutely. So what I'm studying is the effect on you know, rich kids when they're a majority. So there's about 80% of the population and then there's about 20% of poor kids brought in. Yeah. All right. Uh, let me give you a bird's eye view of the empirical strategy. Uh, I'm going to utilize an admissions, uh, a change in policy in Delhi in 2007, which forced private schools to start saving 20% of their seats for poor kids with full scholarships. Uh, right, yeah, so, so these are highly regulated private schools. Uh, and, and this includes quite elite private schools, which is what I'm going to focus on. Think, think of schools where the typical rich kids attending are above the 95th percentile of the income distribution. So there's some correlation between these things even in cities. Uh, however, th this was, you know, this, this, the admissions policy here was strictly along income lines. Uh, and so it's not, it's not quite like rural India where those things are very highly correlated. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to use two types of variation in the mixing of rich and poor students. So, you know, what we call identification strategies. Where one is going to use variation across classrooms in whether or not there are any poor kids. So that's going to be comparing within schools across cohorts which are or aren't affected by the policy change, and then within a given cohort across schools which are affected or not affected. But a second strategy instead is going to look within the classroom. So if you're in an integrated classroom, do you or do you not have poor study group partners? 
And that's going to use the fact that some of these schools assign study group partners by alphabetic order of first name. Right? So that's going to say, what's the effect of personally interacting with sitting next to for an hour a day uh, you know, a poor kid if you're a rich kid? What's the definition of poor here? So you know, uh, the, the policy had a particular definition. So that was a, whole, a family earning uh, at, at market exchange rates about 2,000 US dollars a year for purchasing par parity multiplied by three. Uh, so these are, you know, the, uh, I'll, show you, I'll show you a bit more about this uh, in a little bit. So these are not necessarily the poorest of the poor in India, but they're from homes where, where the family makes one-tenth of what the rich kids make. And Isu, can you tell me a little bit what, what that means in Indian society? Are these drivers? Are these small merchants? Are these factory workers? So not, 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 not small, well, OK, so maybe some small merchants, but more drivers. Uh, factory workers, domestic help. Uh, so so that, that's what you want to think of for the poor kids. Yeah. Do you have a sense of how much was the tuition compared to their income? So, so they were, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a lot about this in just a few minutes. OK. So, so you know, that's the variation in the mixing of, of rich and poor students. But what am I actually measuring? What are the outcomes? So a lot of the work in this paper went into you know, measuring these social behaviors, which is not something you easily find in existing data sets. So I conducted extensive field work to measure these outcomes for about 2,000 students in 14 elite private schools in Delhi. And I measured pro-social behavior and generosity first by collecting administrative data from these schools on student participation in optional volunteering events at school. Uh, but I also invite these students into the lab, uh, as it were, to play dictator games, where I give them sums of money and they have the chance to share it with others. And it's a way to, at least in this somewhat abstract lab setting, directly observe their generosity in an incentivized way. How do I measure discrimination by the rich against the poor? So I observe how students choose teammates for an incentivized sports contest. And I'm going to look at, do you pick high ability poor kids or not? You know, do you discriminate against the poor even when they're high ability? Uh, and I'm going to also directly elicit your willingness to socialize with the poor outside of school by inviting students to attend play dates with poor kids and then, and then you know, figuring out whether they're willing to attend those. Yeah. So two questions. For the volunteering for charity in school, or for charities in school, is there the same pressure to use charities as a way of filling out um, a student's CV or college? No. So you don't have that. Okay, yeah. so that's not and these are young kids. I'm actually, I haven't told you yet, but I'm working with kids who are still in elementary school. But I mean, is there still a, a, a kind of, I don't want to say a professionalization towards college that would suggest to them that volunteering is something that they... No. So it doesn't count for admissions in any college in India. And then my second question is the willingness to attend play dates. Um, you're inviting them. How do they see you? Do they see you as an administrator who is asking them to, to attend something? Yeah. So uh, you know, how this thing is motivated is as an opportunity to make new friends in your neighborhood. So the invitation is to attend a play date hosted by a neighborhood school that mostly serves poor children. Uh, uh, and it's presented to them by their school teachers. So, so, I, so I'm, I'm there as well. So, so I have to get you know, permission from the parents and things like that. So, so they know that this is, not, this is the first time this is happening. But they're also told that there's a po you know, possibility, if there's good, you know, a good demand for this, that you'll do this, they'll do this every year. And the schools are kind of supporting this uh, you know, this opportunity to expose their students to, to, to people from a different social background. So it's coming from the teacher, though. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and finally, I also study more classical sort of economics or uh, labor or education economics outcomes, effects on test scores, but also reports from teachers on disciplinary infractions by students. So one concern was that these poor kids will come into these schools and they'll ruin discipline. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm measuring that directly. Uh, let me give you uh, the main result. Yeah. Um, can you remind me what year was the regulation change? In 2007. And what year are you performing this? 2011 and 2012. Okay. Yes. So it's, it's a few years. So the kids I'm going to be studying would have been exposed, rich kids who have been you know, in the same classrooms as poor kids for four to five years. But what about selection by parents into schools that, that I'll, I'll talk I'll talk a lot about this. I think we should, even though he's being super, super nice about yeah. questions, I think we're because we won't get to all the good stuff. <laughs> and it's not you, David, it's me. 
I'm, I, I, I'll you know, it's a big concern, you know, I, I'll, and I'll talk about it in the slides, and of course it's in the paper as well. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I, no, so I gave a talk at MIT yesterday, and, uh, you know, by now they'd asked me about 120 questions, so, uh, so this is, this is fine. Yes. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm not saying that was a good thing. Uh, all right, let me give you a preview of the main results. I find that having poor classmates and interacting with them personally by being assigned to the same study group, both these things, tend to make these wealthy students quote unquote nicer. They become more pro-social and generous. That is, they volunteer more for charities at school. They give more in these dictator games. And intriguingly, they become more generous towards poor kids, but also towards other rich kids. So it's not just that they become more charitable towards the poor. And that appears to be partly driven by the fact that they're choosing more equitable or sort of equal distributions of monetary payoffs in this economic lab, okay? They also discriminate less against the poor and become uh, uh, more willing to socialize with them. So they choose poor teammates more often for a sports contest, and they become more willing to attend play dates with poor children. And I find that, that, that these changes, these striking changes in social behaviors come at overall mild effects, you know, mild negative effects on learning and discipline. Uh, you know, you might argue about whether it's a zero or a slight negative effect. Uh, let, me, let me skip the related literature, except to say that there are people in this room that have worked on it, uh, which makes it particularly exciting for me to be here. Uh, all right, so just a few things about the empirical setting. This project is set in Delhi. So, you know, Delhi is in India, a country with high and rising inequality. Delhi, Delhi within India has three million school-age children who attend three types of schools. I'm going to focus in, the job, you know, in this job market paper on elite private schools. There are about 200 of them. Uh, where, you know, less than 3%. Does a high number mean a lot of inequality or little inequality? Sorry, a, a lot of, more inequality. So, so one would be, you know, the most unequal you could possibly get. Yeah. Uh, you know, these numbers are kind of disputed, so I wouldn't believe too much the comparisons between countries, but, okay. So, you know, less than 5%, less than maybe 3% of the population sends its kids to these elite private schools. And so the kids here are going to be, you know, the future titans of industry, the top bureaucrats of India, politicians. Uh, and, and so I, I'm going to be studying how the social preferences and behaviors of really elite, elite kids who, you know, you'd expect are going to sort of in the future be manning the levers of power in Indian society, how they are affected by being exposed to poor children. And you might expect that, you know, I'm going to be studying that. It could be that if I was studying less elite rich kids, things might be different, uh, which I think would be an interesting thing to explore. So let's say a little bit about these elite private schools. They're expensive, so the annual tuition there is essentially unaffordable for, for the median uh, household in Delhi. Uh, the schools are very selective. They accept typically you know, two to 8% of applicants. Uh, but they have strictly regulated admissions criteria. So they have to be very explicit about how they rank candidates, and they have a point system for the neighborhoods you live in. Crucially, a lot of points for having older siblings in the same school. So essentially, if you have an older sibling in, in this school and, and you're now three, between three and four years old and trying to start preschool, you're, guaranteed admission, you're almost guaranteed admission to the school your older sibling attends. That ha that's true both before and after the policy change. And when help me that deal... regulation or yes. that? So, uh, oh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it's a regulation that they dislike. I think they're perfectly happy with yeah. it. Uh, but it is, it is something, you know, the government of Delhi actually has a lot... Each time the schools change their admissions criteria, they need to get permission from the government. So th these are highly regulated private schools. Yeah. Uh, so the fact that you know there are these young all private schools are highly regulated. Yeah. These are no, regulated. they're all highly regulated. Yeah. But you would imagine there's more attention paid to regulating these schools just because they sort of loom larger in the public consciousness. Okay. okay. So the fact that that you know younger siblings receive a lot of preference is actually going to help me deal with some of the selection concerns. Essentially, before and after the policy change. If you can identify who the younger siblings who are, who are now applying to schools are, they're, they're, going, to be, they're going to be the same kid, you know, uh, so, yeah. Okay. So the policy change happened in 2007, and it said 20% of new admissions need to be poor kids. The schools which were subject to it were schools which had received land from the government at subsidized rates, on average about 40 years ago in my sample. Uh, and that's only 90, well, I mean, that's 90% of elite private schools, but there remained another 10% 
right, which weren't, which hadn't received land from the government at subsidized rates, I'll talk more about them. They're very helpful for me as a control group. Okay. Uh, the policy required a question that no fees be charged to these poor children, although the government chipped in with a partial subsidy to the private schools. That, that, that subsidy was a lot less than what the schools would normally charge a fee-paying student. The policy also required that these poor kids be integrated into the same classrooms as the rich kids, and that's important. Right? So you can't admit them, but then stick them in a separate classroom. Uh, here's a sense of, of how radical this policy is. What I've plotted here is the, is the CDF of, you know, of the household income distribution in Delhi. Uh, so the rich kids in my sample, you know, from survey evidence that I'm collecting now, are all from well above the 95th percentile of the income distribution. In the US, the 95th percentile is around $200,000 a year, okay? The eligibility cutoff for the poor kids was 100,000 rupees a year, which is around the 45th percentile. In the US, that's around 40K. And the average poor kid who, who's in my sample who benefits from the policy changes from the 25th percentile. In the US, that's around $23,000, right? So, so you're, you're integrating kids from really very different parts of society. What would that be in the US? He just said. Oh, uh, $23,000. Cleans my room at the hotel. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Works at McDonald's, whatever. Right. So in India and here in the U.S., it's about a ten tenfold difference in in uh, in household income. Yeah. So the, 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 the specifying is U.S. equivalent visa. The, the percentiles. Salary in the U.S. Uh, or is this twenty fifth percentile in the U.S. is twenty three thousand. Exactly. So this is the so this is not com market exchange rates or purchasing par parity from the rupees. This is uh, you know uh, you can exactly exactly yeah. okay. All right. So in 2013, actually 20 now it's going to be 2014. This policy is being extended to every private school in India, and is in fact is going to be unconditional on having received any subsidy. So it's a new federal law that every private school starting this year. Uh, they have a few years maybe to, to figure out how they're going to do it, have to save 25% of their seats for poor kids and not charge them any money. Okay? So, India... So, the, so in Delhi, that's what it was, and that's why that's what my second paper sort of uses. But, uh, but, but, but different states in India will have the right to determine selection processes, uh, uh, you know, independently as they decide how to roll out the policy change. Okay? So India has 400 million children under the age of 15. Uh, actually, just two days ago, this number changed to 35%. So 35% of Indian kids now attend private schools. Uh, you know, the 30% number was from three years ago. So, so you can judge how, how fast the sort of rate of increase is. So, 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 so you know, 100 million kids uh, are, are already in private schools in India. Uh, and that number is growing. Okay. So this could potentially lead to pretty large-scale changes in social behaviors. All right, uh, let me talk now about identification. Uh, normally, I spend a large part of the talk on this. I'll try to, I'll try to spend a little less because honestly, I think the, the graphs and pictures I'll show you at the end will convince you of a lot of the results. Uh, but, but please do stop me if something is less than clear. So I'm trying to identify uh, the causal effect of having poor classmates. Uh, if, uh, and therefore, I need exogenous variation in having poor classmates. And I'm going to use two strategies. The first, as I mentioned, is this variation across classrooms. And the other is going to be variation in your exposure to or interactions with a poor kid within the classroom. Let me give you, a, a, you know, one half of the, of the first part, the variation across classrooms. What I've plotted here on the y-axis is the number of poor students in these private schools. On the x-axis is the grade they're in when I visit them first in 2011. What do you find? This sort of sharp drop. So in fourth grade and above, it's basically all rich kids. In third grade and below, there are a bunch of poor but kids. you have sibling pairs in those two samples of the rich kids. So I do have siblings, so I don't always have pairs. But, but let me, so, so why, do we, why do we have this first? Well, it's because the policy started in 2007. It's an admissions quota, so only for new admissions, which at these elite schools all happen pretty much at the preschool level. So, so these kids up here in, who are in third grade when I visited them joined preschool in, uh, in 2007. Yeah, uh, Dennis. Sorry. So before we talk about identification, what's the mechanism through which the poor kids are affecting the grades of the rich? Can you say that a little louder? Mechanism. What's the transmission mechanism? So, I mean, you're talking about identification, but what are you identifying? A grade is not a rating. It's a... Sorry. Uh, so, 
so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to interpret that question. When people say, what's the mechanism, they mean many different things. Uh, you said also what the outcomes are. So of course, I'll talk about the outcomes in great detail soon. Uh, what I'm going to show you is that the fact that, that personal interactions between rich and poor kids, uh, which, I'm, which I'm getting by having exogenous assignment to peer groups, is a, an important driver of the overall result that I'm going to estimate. So that seems to be important. In terms of the underlying psychological mechanism of what's really changing for these rich kids and why their social behaviors seem to be different, let me circle back to that towards the end of the talk. I think there are a couple of different things going on. And to be honest, I'm not going to shed a great deal of light on it. Uh, I'm mostly going to be saying changes in behavior. And then I'll, I'll do some speculation at the end about what the psychological mechanism could be that I think is most plausible with the overall pattern of results. Is that, does that? Sure. Was that, was, was that, was, was one of those the questions you were asking? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> OK, yeah, but please, please, please come back to it later. Yeah. OK. So, so you can imagine already that one of the things I'm going to be doing is comparing rich kids who are in grades 2 and 3 and therefore have a bunch of poor classmates with rich kids in grades 4 and 5 who don't have poor classmates. But that's not all. I also, as one of you already brought up, have variation across schools. And this is not randomized variation. It wasn't an experiment. Uh, but there are three types of elite private schools. The first is what I'm calling treatment schools. You know, this is about 90% of, you know, this is basically most of, uh, by far, almost all of these elite private schools. They were subject to the policy change in 2007, and they complied immediately. But then there are these delayed treatment schools. These are schools that were told by the government, you're subject to the policy change, but they didn't. They chose not to comply in the first year, either because their admissions process was already too advanced, or because they hoped that the, the, the policy would be overturned in the courts. But the court then you know, upheld the policy, and the following year, they were forced to comply. So I'm not going to say these two types of schools are the same on average. But what's going to happen in these schools, in the delay treatment schools, is that jump that I showed you is going to be shifted over by one year. right? And then finally, there are control schools, which were just not subject to the Delhi policy at all until this nationwide rollout now. That's because they had not received land at subsidized rates from the state government. Instead, they had received it from the federal government or from private charitable foundations both of which own a fair amount of land in Delhi. So in these schools, it's going to be rich kids all the way through, right? in grades 2 through 5. Yeah? Did you see any rich kids dropping out after this policy? No. So you don't find, uh, you know, one, one thing that's important is the integration is only happening in the new admitted cohort. So if you were already in one of these fancy schools, you're never going to have poor kids brought into your classrooms. They'll only join the next cohort. And essentially, the way these schools work is it's so hard to get admitted to any of these schools at a grade other than preschool. Because you know, essentially, no one's dropping out and there are no vacancies created. That it's, it's basically almost impossible to transfer between schools. But there was no type of backlash where, you know, where parents are- Not as much as you would think. But you know, partly the thing is the parents have no choice. Like, it's very hard to, where would you send your kid if more than 90% of these schools are subject to the policy change? Yeah. OK. So, you know, what's the sample for this sort of strategy? Uh, it's 14 schools. Uh, within that, nine of them are treatment schools. And I've kind of oversampled these delayed treatment and control schools. So two delayed treatment schools, three control schools. And within them, I'm going to get students from grades 2 through 5. Why those grades? Well, those are the grades that kind of span that jump, right, in the, in the presence of poor kids. And about 2,000 randomly selected students there. Much more students in the treatment schools, or do you correct for that so that you have the same number of students who are treated in So I don't need to correct for that in some sense. I definitely have much more students in the treatment schools, uh, you know, and that's you know that may not be necessarily optimal in terms of power, but uh, yeah, we can we can maybe talk talk more about what that would mean uh, for statistical power. Okay, so uh, I'll sp I mean I'll. Sp Spare you, I think, the, the regression, except to just say that I'm going to control for school fixed effects, so the average levels of these outcomes in the different schools, grade or cohort fixed effects, so the average le outcome in grade 2, in grade 3, in grade 4, across different schools. Right? You might think age might matter for these things. And then I'm just going to say is a 0, 1 variation in was your cohort in your school subject to the policy, and therefore do you have a bunch of, you know, do you have 20% poor classmates? Uh, so some issues already came up with selection. So you might think that there's this policy change where you know that 10% of schools are not subject to it in the first year. 
So if you're, for example, a poor parent, uh, a rich parent, who really doesn't want his kids sitting next to a poor kid, you might try extra hard to get into one of those control schools. As it turns out, I find no increase in applications or acceptance rates at the control schools relative to the treatment schools. Uh, but I also have this, this ability to find a smaller sample of kids who are going to be less selected. These are these younger siblings who both before and after the policy change were going to be admitted to this elite private school. Yeah? Are you having public conversation right here with the parents in these schools already so that they were aware of? Very little. So when the policy was first implemented, it was just, you know, it was done a month and a half, or it was announced like a couple months before admission season. So it was just, it was very, it was very rapid implementation, and I think people just didn't know all that much about it. Okay, so I think that's why you don't see more applications to the control schools. So we shouldn't see too much surprise that there isn't a lot of blowback yeah. from this because it sounds like parents may may have been too late to have yeah. done anything yeah. that looked like changes in application yeah. pattern. Yeah. Okay. You may also worry, you know, there's another issue with selection here, which is just mechanically these fancy schools have to become more selective with rich kids. Right? Twenty percent of their seats are now going to poor kids. So maybe they're selecting better rich kids now, right? They're only getting choosing the top 80% of what they were choosing before. Uh, you know, again, I can use this, this subsample of, of the siblings, which we think might be less selected, at least on their baseline ability. Uh, but note that these kids are between three and four years of age. The schools are not allowed to test them or interview them. Right? There are no pre-existing test score measures. So it's, it's probably quite hard for them to to do a good job selecting on ability, although they are selecting on you know, parent demographics. Oh, I have another question. So when the, the poor kids, how should I match the neighborhoods in which they grow up? I mean, I've been to India, so I know a little bit about but I have no idea who earns how much and what sort of. So what should I match? So a lot of the poor kids in my sample. How many, how many children sleep in one bedroom? What is sort of the? No, great, great. Yeah. The house is that sort of so. What is sort of the kind? So a lot of the poor kids in this sample uh, come from you know these things which are actually officially classified as as slums. So that means you know they're they're almost all none of these are not sort of street kids living on the street. They're not even kids living in some sort of uh, completely uh, temporary structure. So they're living in homes you know built with bricks and concrete. They often don't have a water connection in their home, but may have like a shared you know, share tap that multiple homes will, 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 will use for, for water supply. Uh, so, so these are pretty poor people, but they're not the poorest of the poor even within Delhi. So you can imagine they might have a toilet, but they have a bucket which they use to take a shower and things like Exactly, that. exactly. And you know, there's variation. So some of the, some of the, poor, some of the poor, poor kids who qualify are from, you know, are better off than that. And you know, their father will own a motorcycle or, you know, something like that. So you know, some of these things came up. There, there, there aren't many transfers, or there isn't much dropout. Uh, class sizes change a little bit, but not that much. Uh, there's unlikely to be a lot of spillovers between different, cohort, between different grades within the classroom, because in Delhi, you spend all your time in your classroom. You don't kind of move across school the way you do in the US uh, you know, between different classrooms. You don't have a common dining area. Uh, so you know. If you grant me this strategy, this identification strategy, it's going to capture the effect of having you know, a bunch of poor classmates. But it's not really telling you anything about the mechanisms of why you might see a change. It could be because of your personal interactions with poor kids. It could be because teachers do something different now and maybe curriculum changes. Uh, therefore, I have this second strategy which instead exploits the exogenous assignment of students to study groups within the classroom, which happens by alphabetic order of first name. Okay. Uh, what is that, you know, it's sort of particularly helpful to me that some schools use this policy and other schools instead frequently reshuffle these study groups. And these are study groups in which you spend on average an hour a day, you know, working on a craft project together, working on reading comprehension or math problems. Uh, and some schools, you know, assign, assign them alphabetically and some just mix you. So they, they, they aren't and they needn't quite be because what I'm using in my strategy is if your name is John, it really matters if, the, if there's a poor kid called Joseph or, you know, and if there's someone called Josh in between the two of you. I mean, I may have gotten the ordering wrong, but, <laughs> but I'm going to use variation. Is the poor kid's name right above yours or a little bit further away, right? And because I have the schools which don't use alphabetic assignment, 
there I can look to see, does having a name right next to a rich or poor kid in an alphabetically sorted list, does that predict the outcomes? And as it turns out, it doesn't, okay? But you know, here's, here's a graph to kind of tell you, you know, show you the first stage of the IV regression here. What I'm plotting on the y-axis is the share of rich kids who have at least one poor study partner. And on the left are the schools which don't use alphabetic order. They, they, they shuffle the groups regularly. And so, you know, the, the dark bar is, is for rich kids whose, you know, whose name right above and right below, there are other rich kids only. And the light bar is, is at least above them or below them or both, there's a poor kid. And in the schools which don't use alphabetic order, sure enough, that doesn't predict whether you have poor study partners. But in the schools that, that do, there's a big effect, right? So, so in the light bar, that means there's a poor kid with a name right above or right below yours. And that means you're very, very likely to have at least one poor study partner. That also is probably a correlation with caste, which so, I think was one of the... So it's important, it's important that they use first name, which is not about caste. It's last name, and that's the reason. So in my college in India, and in many schools in India, first name is used to sort of sort students because that's not about caste. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that even so, having a name that tends to be right next to a rich or poor kid might predict something about you. Maybe it means you're more like a poor kid in some way or you know, more like them. That's something that I'll be able to pick up in these schools, right? Okay, so uh, I'll spare you the regression and, and, and move to talking. I think you know, I, uh, we, I still have half an hour to go, so. So uh, I'm happy to stop now to take any questions that you might have, or I can start talking to you about the outcome measures. Okay? All right. So the first thing I try, you know, I'm studying is, is generosity and pro-social behavior. Uh, and, and let me tell you about, about, about how I measure this using dictator games. So if you're not familiar with dictator games, what you're doing in these things is you give these kids, you know, you give the, the person playing the game some money, and you give them the option of sharing some of that with a recipient, okay? So I'm giving the kids 10 rupees, which they can exchange for candy later if they, if they so please, so 10 pieces of candy. Uh, and I'm having them play this game twice, where the order of the games is randomized, and they're separated by a bunch of other tasks. The difference is in one game, they're playing with a poor kid, and this is not the poor kid integrated into their classrooms, right? There wouldn't be a fair comparison there for the control group. Instead, it's a poor kid at another school, someone they don't personally know and may never, you know, will, will, will likely never meet. All they're told is they're told the name of the school, shown photographs of the school, the schoolyard, having kids playing there. And essentially, you know, the variation in the types of schools and facilities is so enormous that when you see this and in debriefing, these kids get that they're playing with a poor kid. Right? They're playing with someone not quite like them. In the other game, they're playing with a rich kid they don't know. So this is a rich kid at another school that's like theirs. Right? And they're in the debriefing, they'll get that they're playing with someone that's a lot more like them. Uh, let me show you the result. Yeah. What's the setting where you're playing this game? So they're, they're, they're in, their, they're in, a, in a room in their school, so uh, a separate experimental session. They're not face to face with those kids or anything. They're just told who the, reci you know, the recipient will be from this school. So uh, they're also not making the decisions face to face with me or any a research assistant. They're indicating the decisions they prefer on a decision sheet which then gets kind of folded, stuffed in an envelope, their name isn't on it, only a serial number, kind of goes somewhere else and then comes back to them. So we do what we can to preserve anonymity here. And, and you're saying they're doing this as individuals walking in a room or are they co-present with other young people? No, they're, they're making individual decisions. And are they passing any students when they leave this room? No. Okay. Well, oh, oh, no. Well, I mean, yes, yes, so, so they are. So, but, but, but the money, the payoffs that's given to them is in a sealed envelope which they, if they wish, could, could you know, open it and buy candy, but they don't have to. I guess I'm asking, are they seeing the other participants in the dictator game? Is there a way that they might be seeing them, encountering them in the setting where you're Yes, doing? so they are seeing other participants, but they're, they can't see what the other participants are choosing. Right. Yeah, so, so the other participants are seeing other participants from uh, their school. Other rich kids from their school, right. yeah. You know, and poor kids from their school. Can you tell us what the game was? Uh... <laughs> sure, let me tell you very quickly again. So essentially, you give these kids 10 rupees, and you give them a chance to decide how much of that they'd like to share with the recipient, who's either a poor kid they don't know or a rich kid they don't know. And if they don't share, they keep the money? They keep all the money, yeah. yeah. And the, it's not like the dollar splitting or something where the other person has to accept? No, no. So this is, there's no strategic behavior here. You, you get to decide you're the dictator. Okay. Let me show you, let me start to kind of piece together the result using the variation at the classroom level for how much you give to a poor kid you don't know. 
What I'm plotting on the y-axis is the percent of your endowment of these you know, 10 rupees that you shared with a poor kid. On the x-axis is the grade you're in. And the solid green line I'm showing you now is for, the, is for rich kids in control schools. Right? So these are the schools where it's all rich kids throughout that they have no poor classmates. You, do, you see maybe some evidence of a trend over age or time, but you know, nothing, nothing super striking. Let me add in now the treatment schools. So what's going on here? They look a lot like the control schools in some grades and quite different than them in others. Well, it actually lines up with the experiment because it's precisely in grades two and three that the treatment school kids are actually treated by having poor classmates. Whereas in grades four and five, this is before they joined before the policy change, they don't have any poor classmates. Yes, in all cases, of course, I'm only gonna show you the outcomes, for, you know, the, the choices made by rich kids. So it's only in the treated grades that the treatment school kids are actually being more generous to the poor. And finally, let me add in the delayed treatment schools, right? This kind of lines up perfectly too because in grade, grade three, the delayed treatment schools are not treated, right? Because they respond a year late. So this is suggesting that having poor classmates makes you more generous towards the poor in this dictator game setting. So poor classmates give less than rich classmates. Uh, in some sense, you might think the stakes loom much larger for them. So 10 rupees is more money to them than it is to, uh, to a rich kid. Yeah. So yeah, so one thing that's not going on here in any of the results is that you have these poor kids brought into your classroom and they are more generous or they, they care more about inequality themselves or they discriminate less against, you know. So it's not that that's, you know, it's not just that there are kids brought into your classroom who are different than you and you adopt their habits or their behaviors. That doesn't seem to be what's going on. Right? So I don't, the poor kids are not more generous than the rich kids, right? Okay. How much do they give to the rich? So, uh, you know, they give uh, about the same on average to the rich. Uh, they give a l maybe a little bit less. Uh, and, 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 and I'm gonna show you sort of the, you know, the effects there. So you'll see that in just a sec. Okay, yeah, they're giving about 25% of the endowment on average to poor kids. So one question is, is this effect driven by personal interactions? So is the mechanism, you know, spending time with a poor kid as opposed to your teacher telling you, hey, you should be more generous, you know, now that there are poor kids in the classroom. So here's the, here's, here's, here's the you know, what you recognize as the reduced form of the IV regression. So what do you find? Well, in the schools which don't use alphabetic order, having a name right next to a poor kid doesn't seem to matter for how generous you are to the poor. But in the schools which do use it, you're more generous if you have a name that's right next to a poor kid, okay? And when you do the IV regression, of course, it's going to kind of blow up these estimates because you know, this is just having a name next to a poor kid. I'm going to use, uh, do you actually have a study partner who's poor, okay? Let me, uh, Dennis, no, okay. Let me show you these results in a regression. I'll, I'll probably only do that for this, you know, for this set of results and then, uh, you know, you can, you, can, you can look at the other results, uh, you know, in the paper. So the first column here is, is the sort of difference in difference, the variation at the classroom level thing I showed you. Where what the, you know, and this is for this full sample of rich kids. It says that being in a treated classroom, that is having poor classmates, makes you give 12 percentage points more, right, to a poor kid. That's on a base of about 27 percentage points giving, so it's a large effect, about 0.45 standard deviation increase in your generosity to the poor. Uh, you know, the second column is using this restricted subsample of the younger siblings, right, that we think might be less selected, and we get a very similar point estimate there, right, which suggests that selection is not a big part of the story, at least on average. And here's the, here's the effect, the IV effect of having a poor study partner here I find that having a poor study partner makes you give seven percentage points more on average. Okay, and instrumented for using this alphabetic order. Okay, so, so, so that's the result on your generosity towards the poor. Uh, yeah? Uh, what about like, you know, having, having poor kids in a lower grade? Because you might see them in school, like, you know, if you compare, if you think about the fact that, you know, control of the yeah, so I guess I could separate that out. I'd been thinking of it more as, oh, that, that could be spillovers across grades, which would bias my results towards zero, right? Yeah. And so I'm underestimating effects. My sense is that you basically, you may see them, but you spend no time with anyone not from your grade, 
even within your grade, you spend all your time in your assigned classroom. And, you know, so there's just not much interest. It's not like US schools where you, at least from what I can tell from the movies, you kind of go from English, <laughs> English class to history class, and then you have a common lunch area where you know, a lot of social dynamics play out. <laughs> Instead, you spend all day in your classroom of 35 to 40 kids. You so you even eat lunch with them. And you just stay there. Yeah, you sit in your seat and you stay there. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, so shackle you to it. <laughs> So, okay, how about your generosity to, uh, to, to other rich kids? Ah, okay, no, I have plenty of time, right? Oh, excellent. Uh, so this is something I didn't have a strong prior on, right? You could imagine, I mean, when I was designing the thing, I thought, well, maybe once you're integrated with poor kids, you, you know, you're, this is forced integration, you'll get really polarized, and you'll start to dislike the poor more, and you'll start to like, you know, affiliate more with other rich kids. Or, or it could go in the opposite direction, I wasn't sure. As it turns out, I find that you become more generous to other rich kids as well. So it's a slightly smaller effect. Uh, but having poor classmates makes you give more to a rich kid you don't know, which I think is, is quite puzzling. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about what I think is going on uh, in a minute. You see that in this, in this study group thing too? Having a poor study partner or having a name right next to a poor kid makes you give more to other rich kids. So what might be going on? Well, you get a hint by looking at the distributions of giving. So you, know, you could give 0, 10%, 20%, et cetera, of your endowment. Uh, up top, I've plotted the distribution of givings for rich kids who have poor classmates. They're in treated classrooms. And below, rich kids who don't have poor classmates. I'll make your life a little easier by, by differencing these out. What you see is. Uh, oh, I, I, should, I should clarify also, th this is how generous you are to a rich kid you don't know, okay? So this is the puzzling one, right? Why are you more generous to rich people? Well, you're choosing much more the equal split of the pie, mm -hmm. right? Which suggested to me that what might be going on is being exposed to poor kids in this very intense way in your schools just makes you think differently or feel differently about inequality or, or what's, what's a fair outcome. And of course, this is with, not with earned money, right? So this is money that they've, they've just been given. So it's not clear that, you know, so, so things might be different if these kids were having to work to earn their money, and then maybe they wouldn't split the pie equally. Yeah? Is it equally driven by male and female students? That's a good So overall, the increase in giving is not different uh, across male and female students. So yes, so I think this, even this is going, so basically because so much of the action is here, that must mean that the increase in 50-50 is also not different. Yeah. Okay, in fact, I remember the result. No, it's, it's, it seems to be equally driven by male and female students. There, in your sample, I'm just saying like, you know, Androni, you know, Androni Vestal and stuff, yeah. you know, where, where the, the, the women were much more towards the- Towards the center. And the, and the men were much more extreme in either giving nothing or a lot. Huh. So I, rem I don't remember, I don't think I see much of that in the sample. I don't remember exactly the baseline comparison of men and of boys and girls, but in terms of the increase in generosity and the increase in choosing 50-50, that's not different, different across boys and girls. How old were the men and women in the study you mentioned? Oh, they were students, college students, yeah. They were college students. Very different yeah. From, yeah. Yeah. from these young yeah. kids. Yeah. From these young kids. They're pre puberty. Student, maybe the 20% <laughs> may be getting it, because there's 20% rich, not poor kids in the schools that they're giving to. So not definitely giving it to rich kids, per se. Well, oh, yes, yes. So exactly. So even though, in fact, they are only giving it to rich kids because they're playing with a rich kid in a control school, they may not know that. They may think, oh, there's a 20% chance that the person I'm giving to is, is a poor kid. But the effects on the giving to the rich kids are not 20% of the effects on the giving to the poor kids. Uh, and moreover, in the debriefing, at least, you know, there's, you know, at least the direction is right, that they think this is a kid like them. And in the debriefing, were you able to draw something about how honest they thought this experiment was? If this was just very unique to them? Did they really think this was going to happen? So I think they did think it was going to happen. So uh, one of the benefits and this was intentional for me of choosing to do this project, is working with kids who, this is maybe self-serving, but I really did do a lot of pilot work to try to kind of determine this, is in some ways they're kind of in a sweet spot. They're, they're, they're sophisticated enough that they can make social judgments and figure out who's rich and who's poor very quickly. They're also honest enough that they'll tell me things like, oh God, the, you know, that, that, that kid is poor and he's smelly. You know, so, so, so. Like how old were they? Oh, sorry, I didn't say. Yes, yeah, so the kids in my sample when I first visited were between the ages of seven and 13. So these are quite young children. And 
as Christian said, they're prepubescent, which means even in terms of society, never mind in terms of biology, you don't see as much of a differentiation of men and women as you would have among these college-age kids. Yeah, right? yeah, it's probably true. So are there really recipients over here? Whether yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so no, this is for real. So it goes to kids. Tell them we'll keep the money. <laughs> <laughs> I would be tempted maybe if these were very large stakes experiments, but you know, uh, you know, I can always buy candy for myself. Yeah. Um, how many times did you run the experiment? So this data is based on one run of the Decatur's game. Yeah. So one for the yes, one for so so there were practice rounds up front just to kind of make them understand how the decision sheet worked. Mm -hmm. So that happened a couple of times until people seemed to be clear about what would happen. Uh, you know, uh, but then but then this is just playing it once. Yeah. You know, there's no feedback, of course, right? So. This is not something where you make a choice and then someone else makes a decision and then you learn the outcome. Right. Yeah, yeah. How did this vary, like with the, uh, with the length? Uh, you know, with, you know, having interacted with poor kids for like a year or two years, I mean, you could compare this by grade. Yeah. yeah. So I could try to do that. So I haven't done that. Uh, you know, essentially, it's you've been exposed for either four years or three years, or maybe it's five and four. I forget. Uh, so I could I could look to see if there's a difference there. Uh, I don't know if I, I, I may not be able to separate that out from some cohort effect as well, right? So I'd have to impose some additional assumptions there. Right. Yeah, so I, I don't know the answer. Uh, it could be that you don't need all these years of exposure. It could be that even, you know, a month of exposure is enough to change things, and I wouldn't know. Yeah. What's the minimum uh, exposure time they have in your sample? Uh, so I think it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be three years. Yeah, or maybe four, three years, yeah. So, uh, you know, there, there are some more things I can do to dig deeper at this, uh, you know, inequality aversion. I find suggestive evidence, you know, well, actually not so suggestive. I think quite strong evidence that you can see more of in the paper that, you know, when I make you choose between things like, if you're the first person, do you choose 5-5 five, five or 6-1? So will you give up one rupee to help the other person out by four and come out equal? Or even will you, when, you, when, you, when, you, when I ask you to decide how two other people should split the pie, should it be 4-4 four, four or 8-3? Should it be 4-4 four, four or 12-0? Right, so, so more equal outcomes versus outcomes where the sum of payoffs is bigger. Right? I find systematically that these kids become more likely to pick the more equal outcome. Okay? Which sort of, which sort of uh, you know, is consistent with the increase in this 50-50 giving in the lab. Okay. So let me, let me say also that you know, there are reasons to be careful and skeptical about, about some of these things, playing dictator games with children. They've not done this before. Maybe there are strong experimenter demand effects. So one thing I also have is prosocial behavior in a very natural field setting, which is uh, students have a choice a couple times a year to choose to volunteer for uh, a charity which aids destitute children elsewhere. And this is a choice that they, you know, they have some experience making. Right? I'm not, I collect data from the schools on student participation in these events, and I find that they become more likely to volunteer if they have poor classmates in school or if they've had poor study partners. Okay. Now let's talk about discrimination and social interactions. How do I measure rich kids discriminating against poor kids? Uh, you know, it's something that's, that's hard to observe, uh, but there are, you know, experiments uh, studying discrimination. So inspired by some of those, uh, I design a, a sports contest where I'm inviting students from two elite private schools. So a much smaller sample than before, not, not the 14 schools with 2,000 students, uh, but instead just two schools with about 340 students. One of the schools is a treatment school, the other is a control school, right? They're, they're both elite schools. And I invite athletic poor students from a public school to join the, join the event as well. Okay? This whole thing is held on the sidelines of, a sport, of, a, of an annual sports meet, where you know, the, the subjects are essentially, you know, so essentially the skinny geeks like me, who weren't sort of competing uh, you know, for, for their school, would still be dragged to kind of go and stand there on the sidelines cheering your schools. And, and here they were given a chance to participate in some sports activities themselves. And the key decision they must make is, is choosing a teammate to run a relay race with. Okay? And I'm going to create a trade-off, right? I've invited these athletic poor kids. So I'm going to create a trade-off between picking someone who's high ability versus picking someone who's socially from a similar group to you. And I'm going to require that these kids spend some time with their teammates, right? Not just in the race. They need to spend more time hanging out with the team. 
that's sort of capturing the kinds of labor market settings where when you hire a colleague or an em employee, you need to spend some time with them as well, right? Uh, there are other jobs where that's not true. And, and you might see discrimination even then. Okay, what's the design of the experiment? Well, the first stage is randomization, where students are randomized to different sessions where the stakes for winning the relay race are varied. It's either 50, 200, or 500 rupees. 500 rupees is $10 at market exchange rates. It's approximately one month's worth of allowance for these kids. So the stakes for them are quite substantial. Right? This is going to provide me variation in how costly it is for you to discriminate. Pocket money for the rich kids. Yes, for the rich kids. Yeah, so it, this is much more for the poor kids. Yes, yes. And there's a stage where uh, the kids have to interact across their, their school lines so with, with kids from other schools just so that they can place which is the school for poor kids and which is the school for rich kids. Because kids are all wearing uniforms, it's really easy to kind of uh, identify which school anyone belongs to. Okay? This, this is then sort of the crucial stage, stage two, where, where, you, where ability is revealed and then you make your choices. How does that happen? Well, uh, uh, you're watching a two-person race. It's typically you know, a rich kid and a poor kid competing against each other just in a sprint. It's not a relay race. You see how fast they are, right? And then you choose which one of them you'd like to have as your teammate, OK? Uh, I'm going to call it discrimination if you pick the slower runner. So you could discriminate against a fast poor kid. You could also discriminate against a fast rich kid. As it turns out, I find that no one discriminates against a fast rich kid. He or she always gets picked, <laughs> OK? What are the results? Oh, crap. I, I, so sorry, there's more. So you know, then your choices are actually, you know, you're randomly picked in order, and your choices are implemented. Uh, the races, the relay race is held. You get the prizes as promised. And then there's this important fourth stage where you have to spend time. This is strictly enforced. You have to spend time. Uh, yeah, sorry. So what I mean there is if you end up in a team with, with person X, that doesn't necessarily mean you chose person X. It could be that someone else chose the person you wanted. They were randomly picked to have their choice implemented before you. And so you end up with someone that you, you, know, you wouldn't have chosen. So this is a little bit helpful because you might think, look, kids really don't want to reveal that they're, they're discriminating. So you know, at the same time, I don't want to make too much of this. If you're Bayesian and you see you know, A ending up with B, you should update upwards that A chose B, well, depending on your prior. But OK. All right. So you know, there's this important social interaction stage where you had to spend time one on one with your chosen teammate. I think so. Well, then, aren't a lot of the schools, so a lot of the other schools would have 20% poor no. and 80% rich as well? So, so I guess what I'm going to guess, guess here is you, know, you're belie you, you believe that this school is rich kids and poor kids. So as it, you know, as it turns out, it's true. One of my schools, one of my fancy schools is a treatment school. So in two of the four grades that are in the experiment, 20% of the kids are poor. Uh, but I, I don't think that's, you know, my guess is that's not something the control school kids are, are guessing. Yeah. Got win. If, if I choose you, then we win the race. Do we split the 500 rupees? No, or? sorry, 500 rupees each. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So importantly, this social interaction stage was pre-announced. You knew that you were making a choice not just for a race, but to hang out with this person later too. If I had more power, and in fact, when I go back to the field, I'm gonna, I'd be interested in switching off this thing, so randomly randomizing whether or not you need to also hang out with your teammate. Because you could imagine, and, and there is evidence that people discriminate even when there isn't any need to spend time with people, right? So, so, so that would be interesting to turn off. But I don't have that yet. Here, here are the results. What I'm plotting on the y-axis is the share of rich students discriminating against the poor. Remember, you can only discriminate against a poor kid if he was faster in the first place, OK? On the x-axis is the prize for winning the race, right? The, the randomly assigned stakes for the race. The solid green line is for rich kids who are in control classrooms. That is, they've never had a poor classmate. And the dashed red line is for rich kids who do have poor classmates. OK? What do I find? Well, when the stakes are really high, a whole month's worth of allowance, there's very little discrimination against fast poor kids. They get picked, right? It's as the stakes go down that you see discrimination, a lot of discrimination against the poor, but less so if you've been exposed to them growing up. Right? And I'm calling this sort of a quasi-demand curve for discrimination because I have variation in something that's like the, like the, like the price. Forgive me, yes. I am an economist. Uh, 
and I'm being careful to say quasi because it's not exactly a, a price here. You need to know the probability, the perceived probabilities of winning the races with different partners. Okay, you can see something, it's much noisier because of the smaller sample, but something's... All computer scientists may not write papers which are called the price of discrimination. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a great title, yeah. Uh, okay, on the x-axis is again the grade you're in, on the y-axis is your probability of discriminating. And it's noisier, but you sort of see that in the treatment school, you discriminate less only in the treated grades, right? Uh, you can see this in a regression. Uh, the only thing I'll point out here is, is you discriminate 12 percentage points less if you have poor classmates. And the, that's about equal to the effect of increasing the stakes from 50 to 200 rupees, so a $3 increase in stakes, right? So I can kind of do a, a comparison of how big a, you know, oh, discrimination went down by half in a totally made up experiment, what does that mean? You know, I can say, well, that's equal to this change in the price, right? And I can, I can structurally estimate a really simple model to go from the quasi-demand to the true demand, uh, but I'll spare you the details on that. The final thing that I want to talk to you about is, is, is measuring social interaction. So when I have these results on reductions in discrimination, a key thing that I suspect is going on is that you're more willing to hang out with or more happy to socialize with a poor kid and that's why, you know, that crucial fourth stage where you have to spend time with your teammate, that, that's, you know, my guess is that that's what's driving the reduction in discrimination against the poor. But I also test taste for social interaction directly uh, by inviting kids to attend these play dates, okay? You know, there's some weird things about this experiment which, which I'm happy to talk about, you know, uh, afterwards, but it's motivated to these kids as an opportunity to make new friends in your neighborhood. Again, you're told about the school, you're shown pictures of the school, so you get that these are poor kids. And I'm going to elicit your sort of willingness to play, uh, which, which the economists in the room might find funny, uh, by, by, by using uh, an incentive compatible mechanism to, perfect, perfect. You know, so I'm essentially gonna, gonna figure out how much do I need to bribe you to go on this play date, okay? And what I find is, uh, at each, on the x-axis is, is the incentive for attending the play date, on the y-axis is the share of rich kids who agree to do it. What I find is for each of these price levels, you're more willing to accept uh, the invitation to go on the play date if you've had poor classmates, okay? Uh, let me say a little bit about, you know, about the test score stuff. You know, I've, I've shown you things that I'm going to claim are sort of positive effects on social behaviors, perhaps preferences. Does this come at the cost of academic outcomes? We care about that a lot for public policy. Turns out, you know, not so much. No overall effect on test scores, but some evidence of a negative effect on English language learning. So, you know, I don't want to spin the results. Uh, mild effects on discipline. I find a big increase in, in your likelihood of being cited for swearing, so using inappropriate language in the school, if you have poor classmates and particularly study partners, uh, you know, which you might think is a bad thing, or you might think, you know, you're, these kids are learning something. Uh, <laughs> but no effects on kind of more violent or, or, or disruptive behavior. So, so let, me, let me summarize a bit and then, and then talk a little bit maybe about some of the questions on mechanisms, et cetera. I've shown you that having poor classmates you know, makes wealthy students more pro-social and generous, less likely to discriminate against the poor, more willing to socialize, and comes with sort of some negative but overall arguably sort of mild or zero effects on, on, on academic outcomes. Circling back to the motivations I began with, does segregation affect social behaviors? I think emphatically my answer is yes. Uh, and so the fact that it's hard to measure these social behaviors don't mean that they don't exist and they're not important. It's not clear how to compare them with an effect on test scores. What shapes social preferences, social behaviors? Well, one answer from my paper is that peers at school seem to matter and perhaps more generally exposure to diversity matters. Uh, personal interactions seem to be a big part of the story because I have these two different identification strategies I can look to see how big is the effect of having a poor study partner? I can scale that by the number of poor study partners people have, or the, or the number of people who have poor study partners. And I can say that it seems to explain a lot of the overall effect at the classroom level. And I can't, oh, I don't want to overinterpret this, but it's likely an underestimate of the importance of interactions, because surely you're interacting with poor kids even when they're not in your study group. Okay, yeah. Are you planning to follow these kids? Uh, when was I going to say? Oh, okay, yes, yes. So I don't know if I'm, I'll get to that slide, but yes. I've put in place the infrastructure to try and follow these kids for the next 10 or 15 years uh, until we can get to the outcomes we really care about, right? 
-hmm. marriage market choices, political preferences, charitable donations. You know, similarly, I'm studying the effects on the poor kids. What happens to them? You know, when they when they hit the labor market, you know, do they go to college more? Do they get different jobs? Uh, and I'm very interested in kind of knowing those long run outcomes. Uh, so, am I, do, I, do I have two minutes, or what do you think? Okay. So, 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 so let me kind of end end there, and you know, I'm happy to chat more about about any of these things uh, uh, afterwards. Okay, so please join me in thanking Yasu.